The Tank Museum has been involved in filmmaking for many years. A number of the museum's vehicles have been used in productions dating way back to the 1950s. In the time that I've been at the museum, we've been involved in many documentaries on armoured warfare and helped with some films from around the edges. But being a bit of a film buff, I'd hoped we might one day get involved with a proper, bigger war movie. And in so many ways, that wish was answered with the fury. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can, and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. I think I found my earliest email concerning the project dated back in May 2013 from the location manager, Mr. Russell Lodge. Dear Mr. Willie, I'm researching locations and constructing a feasibility study on a script for an American company that plans to film in the UK in the latter part of this year. The story follows five Sherman tanks and their crews as they approach Berlin in 1945. I was intending to visit the museum this week to learn as much as possible about the Sherman tank and would ask if there might be a suitable opportunity to speak with anyone who might have a good working knowledge of the Sherman to help me into the early stages of production. This was followed by approaches from the art director for the film, Andrew Menzies. We met at the museum and following the meeting, he wrote to me on June the 10th. David, thank you for spending so much time with Russell and I on Thursday. I discussed and showed pictures of your inventory with our director, David. He approved your Sherman M4A3E8 working tank as an option for our hero Fury tanks and wants to get a script to you as soon as possible for the museum's approval. You do show an uncanny understanding of the film process, but once you have read the script, I'd like to talk to you through any concerns you may have with regards to your tank and what it needs to do for the film. As usual, it will boil down to money, and originally I felt we should try to purchase a tank to sell afterwards, but having seen your working Sherman and realising the considerable goodwill and resources your museum offers, it came apparent that it is important to lock in a mutually beneficial relationship as soon as possible with you, the museum and Fury Film. I'd hope a deal can be outlined by the end of the week as I need to move forward on a hero tank in the near future, whether rental or purchase. This began a process of seeing what would be possible regarding what we'd be able to hire out for how long and what the implications of that would be. As the production team had seen our collection here at the museum, a tentative inquiry was made about our Tiger tank. David was extremely excited that you also may be able to rent the Tiger One, and we can discuss that later. Once again, when you read the script, whatever you are able to approve the Tiger to do, we will accommodate. Andrew Menzies. Some of our trustees were against the idea of the loan of the Tiger. There were understandable risks to the vehicle that had of course received Heritage Lottery Fund money and a reputational risk if we, as the custodians of this piece of history, allowed the vehicle to be damaged or involved in a questionable storyline. This is what I said back in 2014. Some of the issues we debated were what one might call the ethical issues. Should a tank, this tank behind me, that we pretty certain has killed British soldiers in action, would the tone be right to allow that vehicle to go on a movie set? The fact it was a tank captured by British soldiers and this film is about an American tank crew. Does that make any difference? There's the very practical element that we've had public money, industry support, we've had an awful lot of help getting this tank into running order. And we're looking at something 70 years old now, so it's, it's a delicate beast. It looks big and butch, but there's so many things that mechanically can go wrong with it. Would we be putting it at greater risk, taking it onto a film set? where there are going to be risk elements. But in the end, what we came down to, we decided that by using the Tiger as well as the Sherman tank in the film, it inevitably would bring more people to our subject matter. And that meets our charitable aims, which is really important for us. Not all were in agreement. I was horrified initially um, because uh, having been responsible for the Tiger for seven years now, um, we know how, what a technical machine it is. We know how, how sort of um, uh, awkward it can be um, when we drive it. 
Um, so to take it onto a film set would, was, was one of the last things I would have done. Another feature that emerged were approaches by a number of individuals asking if certain vehicles were available for hire or reference. It didn't take us long to realise that intermediaries were looking to gain finders fees for locating and hiring vehicles for the film. Establishing the actual structure and points of contact in the production was therefore really important for us. A copy of the script was sent, watermarked as Hollywood have a high level of secrecy in all this process, whether for a media interest or industry rivalry. Interestingly to us, the script was much longer with a major backstory that doesn't appear in the final cut of the film. We had to make sure the tank came back to us in the same condition as it left. And that meant an independent assessment by an expert, making sure that everything looked the way we said it was. And if we were gonna make a claim on the insurance, everybody agreed it was something to do with the filming and not something that had happened beforehand with a 70 year old vehicle. I put together a fairly long and lengthy document on how I saw the Tiger's use, its limitations, how many times we changed gear how many times we start the engine. Um, this is about five pages, um, which tied it down pretty tightly. Um, basically, I looked at how we run it at Tiger Day, um, how many, how many kilometres it does, or, or yards in some cases. Um, so I was quite happy at that time that if the vehicle was going to be used in a, uh, an area similar to the arena, um, and it was used at the same level as Tiger Day, I, I was fairly happy, even though I still didn't want it to go. For the Tiger, there were one or two conditions we were particularly nervous about. One was the state of the ground. After much debate, go-ahead was given and a meeting held at Pinewood to discuss with the producers and the director the nature of the contract and how the museum would benefit. Our biggest concern is putting strain and stress on this tank that it's not used to. And that led us to actually insist that a concrete road was laid where the tank was going to drive. And uh, this is again where we've got to give credit to the filmmakers because they were so keen to have the last working tiger in their movie, whatever we came up with as our stipulations, they were prepared to go away and see how they could meet them. The deal centered around the following things. Money, a six figure sum was acquired for the museum an exhibition post the filming, PR, we really wanted publicity, and of course we had to make sure there was suitable insurance and limitations on the vehicle movement. And basically that meant our crew and our say what happened to the vehicles on set. Meanwhile, the actors had started their training and as part of this, a visit was arranged to Bovington. They had lunch at the World Arms and then a visit to the ranges at Lulworth where some live firing took place. There, one of the gunnery sergeants in his Challenger 2 got his wife on the phone and his wife just wouldn't believe she was actually talking to Brad Pitt. We were taken aback at the secrecy the film people insisted on, but we were told that Brad had just had his new haircut for the movie and that there would be paparazzi after the first shot of him. And of course, this was all the time he was going out with Angelina Jolie and they were soon to be married. At the museum, we drove the cast in via the back door past the rubbish bins. Brad Pitt commented, don't worry, I've seen a lot of kitchens and service entrances in my time. We gave them a talk on the US Army in World War II, and we had a look at the tanks that they would be seeing on the set and using. One of the images we showed them was this one. It's of a US tank crew in Normandy. You might have thought it was actually taken as a still on the film set if it wasn't that the sky was so blue. For the film, our nerves were really centred on the Tiger. The Sherman M4A2 we were much more relaxed about and two of our staff, Buzz and Brian, headed off to the set for familiarisation and training of the actors. Our Chieftain recovery tank was also there to recover any broken down or bogged vehicles on the set. Negotiations about insurance went down to the wire but then it was the time for the Tiger to actually leave. On arrival at the set, the tank was parked on its trailer inside a rub tent, and this was part of the whole production village. 
This had been built on an airfield at Boving Don in Hertfordshire, just north of London. Here the tank was dressed for its role in the film and lots of people came to take a look and basically show their respect. Mike and myself went around to look at the area the tank had to drive over. And as you can see from the look on Mike's face, he wasn't happy at the depth of the mud that covered the concrete pad. Within minutes, the location manager was on the phone and a tractor appeared to grade and lower the earth over the whole concrete area to an acceptable depth. There was also a number of mock-up tigers to stand in for Tiger 131 in some of the shots. One was placed on a CVRT chassis with a blue line added above the track for use when they were computer graphicking the rest of the vehicle there. During the days before the Tiger was to be used, we had plenty to get on with. I was writing text and labels for the Warhorse exhibition that we were installing that winter. Luckily, I was able to catch a desk uh, in a porter cabin used by Ian Clark of the vehicle coordinator. We ran the engine to ensure all was well, but there was still a nervous tension as to when the tank would actually be needed. Then finally, the call sheet was sent for the tank. So it made its way down from the construction village to the first stop. This was part of the airfield where it was offloaded for scanning uh, which also then brought out the director and the producers and lots of cameras. Um, as ever, there was an awful lot of interest in our Tiger tank. This scanning would be used in the CGI creation or recreation of the Tiger tank. Filming had already begun on the field for this part of the script, so we could watch Sherman tanks come across the field with pyros and smoke and flame. It was all fantastic to watch. We also bumped into people we knew on the set. For example, the actor playing the German tank commander was actually a guy we knew as Stingray, who'd been an instructor here at Lulworth. And there was actually many other soldiers who had been hired as extras. The tank was driven down to its official position at the bottom of the field and carefully unloaded. This created yet another flurry of interest. But however famous you were, our staff member Dave Voice, who was there, he had insisted you didn't put mud in the tank, hence the blue booties. At night, the tank was covered with an inflatable tent and a heater put in to keep the vehicle's gearbox nice and warm. The Tiger ran out of its hide and up the hill. And this was completed a number of times. And we had to keep an eye on where the edge of the concrete pad was so we didn't miss it. Every time there was a cut, people swept into action and watching the huge amount of equipment and staff moved from one side of the field to the other, flattening out the ground, raking it up, smoke, flames restarted, all of this so that they could film from another angle. It all gave you an amazing sense of the professionalism and skill these crews have. And you understand why so many directors make their films in England. By the end of the afternoon, when the Tiger had finished its filming, the tank had run so well and the ground felt firm enough that we felt that the Tiger was able to drive straight up the hill and onto the low loader. There was a palpable sense of relief at the end of the day's filming. The Tiger had come through it unscathed and for those of us who were tasked with looking after it, this was a genuine few moment. For those of us who traveled to the set because of the Tiger, the vehicle was loaded up and then it was ready to head back to the museum. The Tiger was offloaded here and ran at some speed uh, to shed as much mud off the tracks as we possibly could. There were still more things to record over the following weeks, such as the sound effects. And of course, the Fury tank would be on site much longer. And Buzz and Brian had to stay there right the way through the winter months um, seeing the tank to the end of its filming role. One thing we found about film sets is this slightly surreal scenes you see on a regular basis. There were some gruesome dummies in the special effects tent. And for kit lovers, an amazing armory and uniform collection. Owen Thornton, who had supervised the uniforms, was generous in allowing the tank crew to keep their own outfits. And as part of the deal, we collected a number of props post-production that we would use in our forthcoming exhibition. So was it all worth it? 
after the event, we said this. From my position now, should we have been involved or shouldn't we? I think we learned some lessons by being involved. I think overall, absolutely, we should have been involved because it was a tremendous experience for staff. We, we've learned a lot, but I do think the key issue that we went in with, it will make the tank museum more famous. It will bring people to the real story behind this tank and a number of other tanks in the museum. And it's got us a level of publicity that whatever we had done, however much money we spend, would not have brought that many people to our subject matter. And that for us meets our charitable aim. So I think we've done our job well by doing that. The Fury movie has given us the best ever opportunity we've got to reach new audiences and be more famous. And I think from that point of view, it has been tremendously successful. You don't get success like that without a lot of hard work from a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. The guys at the front end who are actually operating the tanks had to work tremendously long hours under really difficult, cold, wintry conditions for months. And they put themselves out and got a huge amount done, but not without self-sacrifice. And I still feel we feel the same now. As I took around some foreign visitors, some from South America, some from the Middle East last week, both groups said when they came to this tank, ah, the Fury tank, and they nodded. People still ask to see the tank from the movie when they visit. The involvement brought in money, it gave us an amazing amount of publicity, and the press launch for the film was actually took place here at the museum. And of course, we held the exhibition on the film and our engagement in it, and this in turn brought in additional visitors. We've kept the tank in the set dressing that was added for the film, and the tank goes out at regular events and is recognised immediately as a tank from the film. For some of us, who were only there for a couple of weeks, it was a very intense experience. For some of us, only an intense couple of weeks for Buzz and Brian, who minded the Sherman, uh, coming on for a number of months they were there on the set and they fitted in, and their good humour, their can-do attitude was really appreciated by the film crew. And at the premiere of the film in Leicester Square at the London Film Festival, Brad Pitt walked out onto the stage, he introduced the film, and then his call out to the audience was... We have a, uh, a few uh, uh, tank experts and uh, tank servicemen who helped us out on the film who are here tonight, uh, Boz, uh, Brian, Sting, Charlie, Woo! Uh, and also, uh, uh, which was really appreciated, as you can imagine, by all of us. So for all of us who were involved in the making of this film, it was a very memorable, stressful, but ultimately a very enjoyable experience. That's home. You do as you're told. I won't ask you to do anything I haven't done myself. A tiger! Let's go! Out of here, Don. It's kind of the monster in our movie and is part of a critical sequence at the end of the movie. 